Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Vision Fund public, public hearings. Uh, we're going to be working from about 2 o'clock till 4 o'clock. Uh, then we'll take a break and reconvene at 6 and work till about 8. The first six applicants that we're going to hear from are the Abbott House, Black Hills Junior League, Black Hills Works, Canyon Lake Activity Center, Children's Museum of the Black Hills Community Health Center. We're anticipating that each applicant will uh, speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will have about five minutes of questions. This green light goes for about 10 minutes. The yellow light comes on when you have about a minute of your 10 minute presentation left, and then the red is right at the 10 minutes. And so you know that um, who you are speaking with, and before today, uh, I would like everybody to introduce themselves, beginning on our far left. I'm Pauline Sumption, the finance officer for the city of Rapid City. I'm Katie Kinnan, Vision Fund member. Megan Reader Shop, Vision Fund member. All right, again, Mark Massa, Vision Fund member. George Graspi, and I'm the chairman of the Vision Fund. Heather Forney, Vision Fund member. Tim Johnson, Vision Fund member. Dolan Lalund at Vision Fund. Don Connor, Vision Fund member. Joel Dean, City Attorney. Lindsay Seacris, uh, City Liaison to the Vision Fund Citizens Committee. Thank you very much. Um, now we can proceed with the Abbott House, please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you today, really on behalf of kids here in South Dakota. My name is Eric Clues, and I've been the Executive Director at the Abbott House now for 15 years. And we've been on a, a great role of expanding and adding services for kids here for about the last six or seven years. The mission at the Abbott House is to provide premier services for girls and families. And we put a lot of stock in that word premier. The programs that we operate are top notch. We're located in Mitchell and Rapid City. And we have three programs that we operate. And we've been in service for over 79 years now. The programs we operate are residential care, therapeutic foster care, and independent living. I thought this was the best way to kind of show you what we do in each location, but this is our residential program in Mitchell. Uh, we serve up to 45 girls in this building who have a school, and they come there primarily because they're victims of abuse and neglect to get help. In 2013, and you're going to hear about her in a little bit, we had a lady that wrote a letter wanting a home and a family. And this was the first home that we opened in Mitchell. And it's, we call it therapeutic foster care. The agency owns the home, the vehicles, all the contents, and we hire a married couple to live there and keep kids in the community that can't stay anywhere else. And the reason they come to these programs, as you can see, is there's really no other safe family options that they have. Forty years ago, we would have called these kids orphans. Also in Mitchell, we have two homes that look identical to this one, and they're also for girls aged 10 to 17. So in Mitchell, we have therapeutic foster care for up to 18 girls. The third program in Mitchell that we have is independent living. And this is a picture of the inside of one of our apartments. And this is for girls aged 16 to 23, so kids that are aging out of the foster care system. And again, the primary reason that they get placed or come and stay in, in our independent living program is they're homeless. They don't have any place else to go. Now, in 2000. 15, the state talked with us, the Department of Social Services, about expanding to Rapid City and duplicating what we're doing in Mitchell. About 30% of the kids we serve every year come from the Rapid City area and then want to come back home. And so in 2015, we opened this home up on uh, Catherine Avenue. And this is our boys' home for boys aged 10 to 17. Then about a mile and a half north of that is our girls' home for girls aged 10 to 17. So in Rapid City, we currently have two homes one for boys, one for girls, and we serve up to 12 kids in that program. Now, youth who age out of the foster care system at 18 
have um, a lot of issues in society today. One of the things that uh, we know is 46% of them that age out are employed at the time they leave. 25% are involved in the criminal justice system within the first two years. And 20% or one in five of them end up homeless. And this is taken from the Conference for State Legislatures. In contrast to that, kids that stay in care past the age of 18 as they're aging out of foster care in something like our independent living program shows that it doubles the odds that they will be working or in high school at age 19. It doubles the odds that they'll earn a college degree in their lifetime. And it reduces the pregnancy before age 20 by 38%. And if you just look at the statistics on these last two slides, you'll see that a Bridges program, a program like ours, has a tremendous impact for kids in South Dakota. The, the financial impact, the, the, the program here in town, when it's up and running, will have four homes and apartments. Uh, we will collect over a million dollars a year from outside contracts that we have that will come into town. We will also create a total of 14 full-time jobs. And we talked to someone here at the city, and every job that's created has a 1.3 to a 3 um, multiplier effect on what people are paid. And so one $40,000 job could um, end up in a sixty dollars to $120,000 impact in town, and we'll have 14 of those. But more important than the money, the Bridges program will increase the number of youth who complete their educational goals and really go from a trajectory where they are going to have a lot of issues to one where hopefully they're going to make it and their kids are going to make it and they'll change their livelihood forever. Uh, from Sean Donovan, who was the, the head of HUD here a couple years ago, he reported that over $40,000 is used every year to house and take care of one homeless person in America. Here in Rapid City, about 18 youth age out of the foster care system each year. Uh, we know that from the Department of Social Services. If you take the 18 times 40, has up to a $720,000 drag on the economy here in this area. And that's just one year. That happens year after year after year. We also know that youth who do not finish high school or get a GED are 30% more likely to spend time in prison. If you go to prison, you have a felony, and the rest of your life is pretty bleak after that. So as I said earlier, the Department of Social Services asked us to come to Rapid and consider helping them as they were having a struggle with the, the number of youth that they had that needed help. So our plan to move forward is to add two more therapeutic foster homes here in town, one for boys, one for girls, ages 10 to 17. But then we'll duplicate the effort that we did in Mitchell by adding the apartments to the back side of each home. So we'll have two apartments that are two bedroom in each home. So we'll serve up to four boys and four girls who are age 18 to 23 again, who would otherwise be in homeless situations. Now today we need to raise $2 million to build these homes and we're gonna be asking you for $250,000 towards that, that project. But once we raise that money and we build the structures, how do we fund it? Well, we have established contracts with the Department of Social Services. We've been running the program since 2013 and all of our expenses have continued to be covered. In addition to that, we do charge the young people that go to our apartments rent all of the money that they pay in is escrowed into an account. Um, if they damage the apartment in any way, then we use some of their funds to fix it up before they leave, and they get the rest of that when they move out. Um, in Mitchell, that's proved to be a wonderful thing for kids and helping them get cars or put down payments on future apartments. Our track record at Abbott House is pretty strong. In 2010, we raised over $5 million statewide to build onto our building in Mitchell and change a bunch of our programs there. In 2013, we raised a million dollars to build two therapeutic homes in Mitchell. 2015, we came out to Rapid City and we raised $300,000 at that time and we took out a loan from Black Hills Community Bank for 500,000. And today, the Abbott House is debt free because we continue to do fundraising every year um, in all of our programs. So we think we're well positioned to make another expansion. This is a picture of the home that we are proposing, one of the homes we're proposing to put up. There'll be two identical to this. You can see it's a large home. Behind the garage there is where the apartments are located. So from the street, you really can't tell it's much different than a, a nice home in the community. If you remember the pictures from Mitchell, you can see that these ones look a little nicer. They're designed by kids at Western Dakota Tech. Um, and we call it the Rapid City Flare, I think. Our timetable is to break ground in April. On the first home, uh, on the second home, we want to have it started by July. In October, we would like to have both homes and apartments open for youth to move in. Funding that's been committed 
already. Uh, we have $310,000 in grants and individual gifts from outside of Rapid that we're bringing with us. We've gotten $20,000 committed by individuals and a bank here in Rapid so far, and we have $1,050,000 in pending grants, 250, which is from this group. That would total up to 1.3 million, and if the Abbott House had to, the board has approved us to take out a $500,000 loan. Our goal will be to kick off a fundraising campaign here on February 1st and have all the funds that we need so that we'll keep ourselves in a position where we can continue to respond to the needs of the state and South Dakota. And you can see the total projected cost right now is $2 million. Now in closing, um, I would like to say that I think the Bridges program, hopefully from the statistics you've seen, will greatly increase the odds um, of successfully transitioning youth to adulthood. We know that we can reduce the ongoing costs in our system by keeping kids out of the system and helping them get jobs and move on with their lives. It will create jobs and it will increase the tax rolls here in town and it will add a piece to the puzzle that's not currently here in Rapid City. I'd just like to close with the fact that uh, the funding that we are asking for from the Vision Committee is vital to the program for a couple of reasons. One, it will really help us reach our goal, but two, the group of you that are sitting up there are pretty well revered by people in town, and we're going to have to raise another seven or eight hundred thousand dollars, we know, to fully fund the project. And so by you funding this project, it will help provide credibility to what we're trying to do here in Rapid City. Now, I'm going to have Virginia hand out a, a a newsletter that we have. There's a young lady that wrote a letter, and that's the reason I'm here today. Um, her name was Cherokee, <coughs> and the letter she wrote basically just said, Dear Lord, give me a family, give me a home, give me somebody that I can love, and somebody that will love me back. And that letter came to my office back in 2013. I took that letter to our board president at the time, which was Dusty Johnson, and we just were lucky the stars lined up. We had a gentleman on our foundation board that was also interested. And Dusty said, we have to do something. And so the Bridges program was created from that one letter that that young lady wrote. Now fast forward to today, uh, Cherokee is now living in one of our apartments there in Mitchell. She's attending um, Mitchell Technical Institute and she's going to go into the social work field. And, and it won't surprise me a bit if you're all still around in about 10 or 12 years if she's not somebody that's standing here in front of you um, advocating for kids here in South Dakota. That's all I have. What questions do you have? Anybody here? <clears throat> Chair recognizes Heather. Good afternoon. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for all of your, your time and effort in putting this plan together and everything that you're doing for Abbott House and, and these children in South Dakota and Rapid City specifically. Thank Very you. much appreciated and a much needed uh, program. I, I'd like you to um, talk to us a little bit about the uh, grants that you've already requested, kind of the status of those, where do you think you'll see um, whether or not you've received that additional funding? Sure. Uh, thus far, we've, we've gotten a grant from the Larson Foundation from Brookings, and they've been involved in both of our projects that we've done to support us. Uh, we got a grant from the Ludwig Foundation out of California, there's, there's Rapid City ties. Um, and we've also gotten an individual grant or a gift from an individual in Mitchell. It's going to be a $100,000 matching gift, uh, so it'll be a challenge gift that we'll have to match out here in the community. We've also gotten uh, or submitted a grant for $575,000 to South Dakota Housing. Uh, the meeting actually happened in December, and it was tabled because they were still waiting for some answers from Federal HUD office. They want to give us the funding, and so they're working hard to make it work for us. Um, we've also asked for, Virginia's going to have to help me, uh, 200000 will be going to for, uh, the Vakarovich Foundation, and Vakarovich provided a $100,000 gift when we opened the first two homes here in town. What am I missing? I believe that's all of them. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mark. Maybe. There, I got it. Well, thank you. Um, for the presentation, it was very thorough, and I know the, the group appreciates that. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is with the uh, other entities that are seeking funds that um, possibly are providing some of these services. How does Abbott House 
collect or connect with that uh, like passages and collective impact and then the other question is um, is Avera and Rapid City Regional are they involved in any process that you are currently doing currently doing and do they give you support well and I would say that the program that that we operate um, isn't a program that anyone else is doing so it is I think it's totally distinct and separate uh, the collective impact I've met with charity and and um, they are going to be serving homeless population definitely um, we are going to focus on kids that are aging out of the foster care system and if we do a good job they won't have to go down and use that program um, the passages program and I'm not exactly sure is that the women's program here in town um, I again I think it's it's a again a vital program here in town uh, to transition I believe it's women from prison back to the community um, but again, that's a different population that we work with because the kids that we see are becoming out of the foster care system. And again, our goal will be that they don't end up needing that program down the road. Uh, Avera does support us. Uh, almost every year we submit grants to the Avera system for various things in Rapid and in Mitchell. Um, usually it's at the level of three to $5,000 um, that we get from that organization. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Chair recognizes Heather. I'm going to try not to be a microphone hog. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you were going to start your capital campaign in February. The timing for groundbreaking is April. You hope to actually be up and running by October. Does the February start of a capital campaign seem a little late? And I guess maybe have you had so much success in capital campaigns in the past that you're fairly confident you'll have the funding necessary to, to actually get the building up and running and completed by October? Sure, good question. We, ha we have had a lot of success with campaigns. Um, I will tell you, we've already had two educational events, so we won't kick off the campaign until we have at least half, if not more, of the funding that we need already basically in our in the in our pocket um, we've had some wonderful meetings with individuals out here already and and uh, are pretty confident it's going to go well um, we in, in Mitchell we raised a million dollars um, in about four months um, and we really feel that with the grants and things that we're adding in in this campaign it it should be attainable um, and with the uh, the approval of our board to take out loans we can we can balance the what we need until we can get it done if we need to go past that date but Thank you. anybody else um, I have a question if you could maybe just briefly address you made a point that um, your facility addresses a piece of the puzzle that's missing sure. just how why is it missing what exactly is it that you're providing sure we would call it professional foster care. It's the highest level foster care that's available in South Dakota. Um, at our place at the Abbott House in Mitchell, the residential program, our average length of stay was three and a half years before we started this program. And it started because a young lady said, I don't want to be here till I'm 18, was really what she was saying. And so we started that program and the average length of stay today in our residential program is 11.8 months. Um, over half the, the residential beds in our state have gone away over the last 10 years before, because of funding reasons. And so now it's uh, more important than ever that we have other options for kids that go to, and, and we get kids from Wellfully and Children's Home and you know, all the programs that are out in this area too, but we need options for those kids that go to those programs and do well and don't need to be there because there are always kids waiting. Um, in our program in Mitchell, we have 45 girls there today, and we have a waiting list that goes out till March right now. And we have people waiting until March to get their kids in. And these are kids that are spending time in HSC or Avera, costing the system a lot of money. Um, and so the, these bridges programs, the state of, or the Department of Social Services sees as an alternative to keeping kids in a residential program longer than they need to be. And the research shows that having them in a community and a family setting will best set them up for the future. Thank you. And then. You're asking for $250,000 payable over three years, is that correct? Yes, yep. Then finally, uh, thank you for your presentation. I w was visiting one of your ladies' young girls' homes last night, and we talk about Premier, um, the facility and uh, uh, people providing care there. It is Premier, so it's very good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.
Okay, next we will invite Black Hills Junior League, please. Ed, when you're ready, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Sullivan. I'm president of Rapid City High School Baseball. To my left is Cassie Furchner. Uh, Cassie's president of Black Hills Junior Little League. Um, Black Hills Junior Little League, to give you a little bit of information, um, is a program for 13 to 14 year old boys in Rapid City to play baseball. Um, the league normally averages about 110 to 120 players and is considering offering a senior league division in the future, which will handle 15 and 16 year olds. Currently, the 13 and 14 year olds play in and practice on two fields in Rapid City. Uh, the senior division has to play on a full size field, which would be McKeague Field. Um, they would share that field with the uh, Rapid City High School Baseball League. And Rapid City High School Baseball League consists of four, the four high schools, uh, Stephen Central, Douglas, and St. Thomas More. Um, each team has about 40 to 50 players, uh, in usually a varsity and a junior varsity. Um, the leagues, both leagues work closely with the City Parks Department for the lease of facilities. Um, the Junior Little League leases um, um, Jamie Johnson Field and Horace Mann Field and Rapid City High School Baseball currently leases the McKeague Baseball Field. Um, we work together on maintenance issues and projects. Most of all the maintenance issues and projects are handled by the individual leagues and uh, with some help from, from City Parks and Rec. At the Jamie Johnson facility, for instance, this season the dugouts were painted by volunteers, replaced the sound system. Um, our building, which contains our concession stand, restroom, crow's nest, meeting and storage rooms was painted. We repaired the roof on the main building, replaced our infield, and repaired some areas of the fencing. Lighting was repaired and the batting cages, uh, sign replaced, uh, on and on, um, covering lots of projects that are done every, normally every spring and every fall at all the facilities, and those are done by parents or um, other volunteers. Um, part of it this year that for Junior Little League, the Parks Department did help them out with some of the painting of the concession building just because it's, uh, it's a two-story building and we weren't comfortable with parents uh, up on ladders or scaffolding. Neither Black Hills Junior League or Rapid City High School have currently have an indoor facility for use by its players. Um, many of the other leagues, almost all of the other leagues in Rapid City including the, the four little leagues, uh, the two legion teams, post 320 and post 22, all have indoor facilities. And during their, their spring, early winter season, practice season and throughout the summer, those facilities are, are pretty much booked to the max all the time. And having an adequate practice time for junior little league and for high school baseball being uh, high school baseball actually starts their practice time about now. And uh, they have a very limited uh, amount of practice time allowed by their high schools um, because they are a club sport. I was the coach for Rap City Stevens for four years and I, I had one night a week and it was Sunday night at seven o'clock. And so uh, I had a very limited amount of time to practice in the winter and early spring. Uh, Junior Little League is in the same situation. If we have a winter or, or a spring like we did last year, um, it does get to be uh, very interesting when you, when you only have an outdoor field or outdoor batting cages. Um, the cost of construction of approximately a 42 by 118 foot indoor batting and practice facility will be an insulated building, include restrooms. It'll contain batting nets as well as space for pitching and catching. It will have indoor turf, there will be a loft for storage, and it will be uh, adequate space to hold warm-ups and full workouts, full practices. Uh, facility will be located at McKeague Field. This location was approved already by the Rapid City Parks Department. The project lines with several areas in the comprehensive plan. 
um, a vibrant, livable community by providing additional opportunities for activity for this age group. We feel that would be adding to the desirable vibrancy and livable community. Activities for Rapid City is a primary focus for many parents. Um, keeping the youth involved as long as possible in an activity that they love is our goal. Um, I think getting off, off of this just a little bit, I've, I've coached baseball in Rapid City now for about 40, 40 plus years and, and high school baseball for the last 10 to 15. And I think everyone in the room understands that the, the more you can keep a group of 300, 350, 13 to 18 year olds busy, uh, the better it is for, for our community. Um, the majority of these are great young men, but as young teenagers, they get sidetracked. And, and according to the Rhapsody Police Department, you know, males aged to 13 have negative interaction with law enforcement at a higher rate than any other group. By giving these athletes a year-round place to develop and grow through the game of baseball, we believe that decreases the likelihood that these young men will engage in activities that will result in negative interactions with law enforcement. A safe, healthy, inclusive, and skilled community. Both Black Hills Junior League and high school baseball value community. Players and families contribute time and manual labor every season to ensure that the facilities show well. This instills value and pride. We also support health and well-being through allowing supportive connections with each other. We enable active, active and healthy lifestyles by encouraging physical activity and involvement. We hope that these skills are instilled early and can carry through to adulthood. And I'm a firm believer that in, because of my past experience and, and James Taylor next to me up here is also a coach that it, it definitely does happen. We hope that providing an opportunity for practice and playing and possibly some off season team options as well, if this facility is built, that we can keep this group engaged in positive activities therefore decreasing involvement and in less desirable activities. We also provide opportunities for parents and adults to volunteer through coaching and other activities that support active and involved youth. We welcome people of all ethnic groups, family types, and economic standings. Both of our organizations have funding available for people that simply can't afford to pay the, the fees it costs to play baseball. We never turn anyone away. Outstanding recreational and cultural opportunities since this project has been constructed on City Park's property. We hope to be an improvement, not only visually, but also in the additional use of the property. This would be an asset to the City of Rapid City and the community for years to come. We understand that everything we do at, at our fields, because we are a leaseholder, everything that we do, in, and both organizations have not only put in thousands of hours of volunteer labor, We've also put in thousands of dollars, and we understand that when we're, we're done with a project, it belongs to the city of Rapid City and will forever. And that's part of the, the bonus of what everything that we do at those baseball fields. So every year it provides approximately 300 players with an avenue to practice a game of baseball. With an indoor facility, this would give us the opportunity to provide a year-round practice facility for some of, some of our players. And some of these players will go on to play and college level and who knows, maybe beyond. Um, it also provides opportunity for volunteering for parents and coaches throughout both leagues. Does anybody have any questions for us? Push away. Chair recognizes Mark. Well, thank you. Whoops. Let me try that again. Sorry. We don't do this very often, so. <laughs> Neither do I we. I don't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I figured out how to push the button. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, the questions uh, that I have, there's, can you tell me how many indoor bedding cages there currently are in Rapid City? I know that uh, ASA Girls Softball has one at their complex. Uh, Canyon Lake Little League, Rushmore Little League, Harney Little League, Timberline Little League, Rapid City Post 22 and Rapid City Post 320. All have indoor practice facilities. Um, 
and we probably as a, as a combined group serve more uh, baseball players than anybody. Um, with uh, considering high school baseball will be 150 to 175, Black Hills Junior Little League will consist of approximately 150 players. So we'll serve 300 plus every year. It's consistent. And so as far as McKeague Field and our indoor facility, um, we will serve more young people. The one thing about McKeague Field, I don't know how many of you, I know a couple of members were out there. Um, I've been involved with McKeague Field for about 10 years now. McKeague Field is the only full-size field in Rapid City that allows basically open time. Um, we let people that are not high school baseball players, we let people that are not junior little league. Uh, Black Hills Amateur Baseball shares the field with us. Uh, South Dakota School of Mines Hard Rocker Baseball Club shares the field with us. We have several senior players that practice out there, and then there's a tournament during Labor Day. So um, we plan to continue that with an indoor facility. We're not, we're gonna, we're not going to make it exclusive. If there, if there are a group of people out there that, that do not have an indoor facility, we, we welcome them to share ours. Thank you. Uh, the other question I have is operating costs. I don't know if that's the city or if that's uh, you guys. Once the facility is done, we pick up all the costs from then on. Okay, and then also in your initial application, you had a $30,000 grant that you were looking at. Uh, what is the status of that, and there, are there any other grants that you're looking at? Cassie's handling that for us. That um, is a Little League grant, and the amount that I put in the application has been 30000 but this coming year it is being decreased to 20000 um, and the application is ready to go. I'm waiting for one additional letter of support. Um, the deadline is the end of January for that application, and we should know um, beginning of March if we're awarded that. Thank you. Okay, the chair recognizes Megan. Thanks for presenting. Um, in your initial application, you said that that's, there's no possible way to phase. Are you still um, stick to that? in your application? We'd like to do it that way, naturally, but I guess, you know, we understand the importance of, of what we want to do. Um, we would be open to anything. Thank you. And the second question is, um, the other um, entities that you say that share the McKeague Field, um, do they have any interest in helping fundraise or kick in any other funds? Possibly. I know that Black Hills Amateur League would do it. Um, not, I can't speak too much for Hard Rock or Baseball. Um, they have a tough enough time just getting their club team going, mm -hmm. but I think they would do whatever they could. Um, so yeah, there, there's probably some other entities out there. We, I mean, James is in the construction business. I'm in the electrical wholesale business. Um, we, we plan to, to uh, try and get as much donations as we can. Um, so, yes, we're going we're gonna to reach out to the community for help. Thank you. Anybody else? Chair recognizes Heather. So you mentioned that you plan to ask for additional help and, and you plan to, to try and obtain other funding. Have you, can you give us an update on any work you've done to date aside from the $20,000 grant application? Um, any specifics about other groups that you've talked to about funding? Um, maybe give us some background on um, the level of participation from your members on fundraising? Well, I, I can speak to um, our league specifically. Um, we have a pretty great group of parents annually that, um, that are expected to fundraise just to offset some of our um, league costs. So I don't feel like it would be um, out of line to expect them to, you know, for our league to come up with another fundraising campaign if we needed to do any additional. Um, and I'm sure the High School Baseball Association is, is in the same situation. So as a follow-up, you haven't done any of that type of fundraising yet? No, we have not. 
So our, is the anticipation that you'll wait, see if there's any funding available from vision funds, and then if there's a shortfall, you would fundraise for the difference? Correct. And, and so if that were the case, um, say the vision fund or actually the city council, they, they're the ones that actually make this decision, the city council would say, we'll give you $50,000. Um, can you talk to me about the timing of, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a big shortfall, then do you push back the time of actual project? How would, how would that work? Well, I think, yeah, depending on your decision would, would, um, would determine what, what our project and when that would be finished, because um, then we would certainly have some work to do. Um, with some of you that have been involved in youth sports know that fundraising is a huge part of youth sports. Um, Rapid City High School Baseball, we have done uh, just every year some type of fundraising for equipment of some kind or a new, uh, we built a new crow's nest uh, four or five years ago along with the help of the National Guard. Uh, that was a fundraising project. So it's, so it's nothing new for us. Um, we will take what is determined and we'll go from there and, and our hope is to get this facility uh, built by spring of 2020 at the latest or sooner, but whatever help we get is certainly appreciated and, and, and we'll do what we can to get it done. Chair recognizes Tim. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Does the grant that you're working on affect the vision fund amount you're requesting? No, we would be using that grant money to offset any, in case our estimate is low, um, or any additional items that we might need for internal, um, such as the nets or any of the equipment or anything like that. Um, we hope that our estimate is pretty solid. Um, I've consulted with um, city staff in the Public Works Department to just kind of firm up our estimate that we had to make sure that we were in the ballpark and they assured me that we were we were pretty close. Um, so I'm hoping that that $20,000 then will help offset any additional costs that the project may entail. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and then a comment. One is when I was out there, there were some polls and then do you put nets out there for, so are you going to keep that part of it for the, batting practice? The current outdoor hitting cages will move to the, to the west or to the south. Yeah. Uh, so the building will go right where those are at at the present time. And You'll continue to have that. We'll continue to have an outdoor hitting facility. Then you've asked for $330,000, correct? If, if the, for some reason, I don't know what will happen, but if the Vision Fund were to approve 280000 would that get you going? Absolutely. And then finally, is it Mr. Sullivan? Yes, sir. Um, how long have you been working out at this facility? <laughs> um, I'm the head maintenance guy. Um, I volunteer, and uh, I, I, I can't count how many hours I put in in the spring and summer. But I've been doing it now. Um, probably about close to 10 years. High school baseball took over the lease from the amateur baseball people about 10 years ago. And at that time, I volunteered to uh, make a lot of improvements. And through the work of parents and fundraising, we've done that. But um, yeah, I've I put in a lot of time as the two people standing next to me. We're all volunteers. And well, we'd like to thank all of you for all your volunteers, probably thousands of hours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we invite Black Hills Works, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. I just hit the enter bar, I think, to space to move forward. 
Um, my name is Brad Sadoff. I'm the CEO for Black Hills Works and appreciate you um, listening to what our request is. And for those of you that came out and, and took a look at our location to see what we are looking to do for uh, people with developmental disabilities that we support in our community at large. Um, Black Hills Works, um, we are just finishing up our 60th year in Rapid City. We are the only organization that supports adults with developmental disabilities um, in basically all of their needs that they, they need to live a community-based life in our community. We are the um, alternative to institutional services, which we know have learned over the years really really easily that living a community-based life is much more enriching and valuable than an institutional uh, way of life anyway what we're working to do is take one of our existing buildings over on range road um, it's our black hills works day activity services that building has been part of our black hills works family for 55 years so all but about five years of our existence it's been added on a few times we have um, done our best to maintain it and keep it up and use duct tape as efficiently as we possibly can. Right, Katie? <laughs> um, and we're, we're wanting to bring it to the next level, to modernize it a little bit, to uh, make it more useful for folks with developmental disabilities that we support, but also our community at large. You notice that the name that we have on this proposal is for it to become a unified center. It's taking this location, which has been a Black Hills Works Day activity centered, um, continuing the process of working more and more community into it in a reverse integration mode. Um, we have a gym that is part of our uh, activity center, and that gym, we've been very, very successful in using it for people with developmental disabilities but our community at large in really really large ways um, the night that uh, some of you came and toured you know it was the southwest middle school girls basketball team that was getting ready to go in and use it for practices there but there's volleyball groups and a whole ton of special olympics use in there um, we're wanting to take that building and turn it into a 24-hour fitness center and really get more robust on the recreation and wellness activities that, that go on in this location. Um, I think everybody understands that health and wellness is a really, really important part of our community. It is even more so, I would argue, for folks that have developmental disabilities and to be able to have uh, facilities and equipment and places and support to be able to be very, very active. Um, a lot of times it takes extra accessibility design and extra accessibility considerations to really, really make that robust for folks. Um, like I remember, like I mentioned, we want this to be for all community. Black Hills Works, you know, we, um, we uh, embrace a community where everyone participates to achieve a life of full potential and having the accessibility features built into this location is really really important and that is part of what you know this funding that we're looking for will help really make happen um, some ancillary phases to what we're looking to do at this location we're fortunate to have some really really great grounds with this where we have some greenhouses but we want to expand the use of community gardens to help bring more community members into the property um, we have seen I think phenomenal success throughout our community with the use of the community gardens that we have but really over on that west side of, of town our location if you're not familiar real quick it's kind of between Stevens High School and West Middle School over on Range Road um, there's really not anything over there of this nature and um, it's a great way for people with developmental disabilities to get involved with community members at large and and get involved with um, uh, uh, community gardens. Um, Strider Bikes, um, a Rapid City gem, and we've got some great partnerships with them and been able to use Strider Bikes for people with disabilities in phenomenal ways. We want to continue to work with them and, and build a Strider Bike track um, on, the, on the property also. Um, we feel that this proposal, what we're wanting to do, fits really, really nicely with the Red Rapid City's overall goals. Um, you know, when Rep the city talks about a balanced pattern of growth, we feel what we are wanting to do here 
um, with the location that we have, offers a, a community fitness center as well as a fitness center for people with developmental disabilities in this west side neighborhood where um, it doesn't, there really isn't one that's really, really close by. Um, it definitely, what we are working to do um, is dedicated to an in integrated and vibrant community. When people of the, of the community at large get the chance, the opportunity to interact with people with developmental disabilities, magic really happens. It's not only wonderful for people with developmental disabilities to get to know people of all walks of life out there, but the stories the things that we've seen happen when community members come into programs that we have going on already at this location and interactions throughout the community, get to know people with developmental disabilities as real people, real human beings, and um, the awesomeness that they bring to our community. It impacts their life even more than it does the people with disabilities that we support. I 100% guarantee that. I see it time and time again. And by helping to renovate this facility, what we want to happen, what will happen, is more people will be able to come in in a reverse integration mode, interact with the phenomenal folks that we support, and, and have an amazing experience. Um, safe, healthy, and inclusive community, you know, the way that we want to go by the, about this, you know, definitely is factoring in true accessibility features that some of the folks we're looking at wanting to support need in a facility. And like I just talked about, the bridging people together is um, um, just really something else. Um, to talk about the budget a little bit, we're requesting our, our total project um, that we have remaining to do on this is $1.15 million. We're requesting $920,000 um, in vision funds, and you can see that's in a phase one, two, and three. We've broke, we've done our best to break that down into uh, chunks, and some of those chunks go together. Um, um, you know, there, it, it's a fairly large building, and um, there's, there's a lot that we want to go through and change and, and upgrade over there. Um, you know, as you can see by the timeline, we, we want to get started on this additional work really quickly. Um, um, just so we can make the best use of it for the folks we support in our community. Um, share an overview, uh, map view of our location. Um, some, some, you've probably have driven by the Range Road and seen it from the front. Um, more likely you haven't been out back and kind of to see what that looks like back there, but over on, I guess it would be the uh, right side, the little bit darker gray roof on there, that's where our gym is at. Um, the gym was added onto this location in 1982. Um, up until uh, earlier this last year, it had a VCT tile floor in it for because it was cheap, cost effective, and um, we could keep duct taping that sucker together. Well, it reached the end of its duct tape life, and um, one of the partnerships that we've that we've developed on the, uh, with this location, and what we want to do is with the Legends Ride and Rod Woodruff and um, with the support of him and $100,000, um, we've been able to put a really, really nice new wood gym floor in there. And it is working remarkable, um, not only for the folks that we support, all of the Special Olympics groups out there. The Special Olympics groups include adults with developmental disabilities that we support, but also the kiddos with um, um, developmental disabilities that are in their school district in the special ed program. They did not have a home a place to call home, a home base, until we worked with them and got together um, um, putting this new floor in and creating a place that all Special Olympic athletes could call home. Um, but when we put that new floor in um, earlier this, this spring, um, uh, that roof, that gray roof that you see in it, de developed some leaks, and that is really poor timing for leaks to develop just when a new floor went in. So that's part of our request in there. Um, we have some greenhouses out back with Live Move B LMB Farms that um, is doing some therapeutic work in the greenhouses and again one of our partners that um, um, we want to have involved with us in the development of community gardens also. Um, some drawings that we've had done to kind of illustrate a little bit of the work we want to do. The one on the left is um, about a 4,500 square foot space that 
Um, we ha we're working to convert into that community fitness center. Um, there's a few parts on the budget that involve converting that and renovating the restrooms and getting the nice new equipment in there. Um, some classroom renovations over on the right that involve basically restroom modifications. Locker rooms that are attached to this gym, which the locker rooms um, have a lot of potential, but they're pretty old now and they need attention to bring them up to the, I guess, quality level uh, that special, special Olympic athletes deserve and community members that we want to be able to use this gym deserve. Um, a vestibule entrance into the gym um, to help make sure that the gym stays clean and there's a place for people to kind of put their belongings and gather before and after. Um, and then a, a renovation to the kitchen cafeteria in there. We serve about 370 meals a day out of this cafeteria. Um, so we're putting out some volume in there and it needs some tender loving care right now. Um, so with that, I'll stand ready to answer questions. Very well, thank you. First questions. Chair recognizes Mark. All right, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. It's appreciated. So in looking at your application, uh, you have stated that a comprehensive business plan for operating and maintenance of the updated facility is under development. And you have referenced duct tape numerous times. Mm -hmm. And so it's a wonderful product and it does hold things together. But what, what is your two year, five year, seven year strategic plan, not only for this project, but for future growth future growth well black hills works were a pretty we're a very large organization actually and and on the second submission of questions we included um, a plan of capital upgrade that's in our strategic plan that involve various homes apartments that we have day service facilities um, uh, there's a lot going on there with this building in particular we are hoping we've been making some improvements as we go along as we've been able to fundraise and raise money with um, the Legends Ride, with the Rasmussen Trust, with uh, an organization called Source America that funds things for, for people with disabilities. Um, but what you see here is kind of the final work to bring this to being a unified center. Um, we, you know, if, we could, if we're fortunate enough to get all this funding, we would have this in place by, you know, all in place and operating by 2020. It op we operate it every day right now, Monday through Friday, and we have funding, ongoing funding and staffing that does maintenance and upkeep of it. What we'd have to do is tweak our plan of operating that so that we have just a little bit more maintenance and, and um, some staffing to keep it open a little bit later in the evenings to accommodate more community members and actually the folks that we support at large using it more into the evenings as well. Um, but that, we operate that mostly from service-based funding that we get that can help that, uh, that pays for those needs right now. But um, I think including the application, we talked about a nominal membership fee that we want to be able to help the offset the operating costs of a few additional staff to maintain the extra use in the building. Does that answer yeah. for you? Yes, that does. Thank you. Yeah. Chair recognizes Megan. Thanks for your presentation. <clears throat> I have two questions. The first one, um, do you have any other funding sources that you're looking at to be available? Yeah, we, we've got a request into the, for a community, community development block grant right now. That's a tongue twister for me right now uh, to help with that locker room part. And we're, oh, I don't know. I guess that's tenuous um, on it. But through our foundation, we, we're continuing to work with the Rasmussen Fund and we're getting good indications from them that they like what we've been doing and want to continue with helping some of our work in that building. Um, we're very, very hopeful with the Legends Ride that we've been able to impress and do what the donor has really liked there, that that can grow. Um, and then we're just working as we're meeting with community members all the time, this is part of the vision that we share and trying to find what stories resonate with folks, folks that want to support us so that if they want to come in and use their don uh, donor dollars in this way, we can make awesomeness happen with them. 
Thank you. And actually, you answered my second one, too. So thanks. Yeah, thanks. Chair recognizes Don. Um, first, I want to thank you for the tour the other night. It was very educational, and I feel really fortunate to be able to learn about your organization. Uh, I was just wondering about the cafe with the updates to that. Is that something that might be open to the members that join the health club, or is that going to stages for your facility? Um, it, it very possibly could. What we want to, in the, if you take a look at the drawings for the um, health and fitness center, there's kind of a, I'd call it a snack bar drawn into that. We think that would meet basically the needs and make it a very nice space for people from the community coming in. But we don't, we wouldn't want to necessarily ruin up rule out the cafe. Going into it, the very, very primary goal for that is mostly folks that we support, that part of it. But I would not, we wouldn't rule it out. We're, we, we love to share wherever it makes sense to share. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Chair recognizes the city attorney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Brad, when we've done vision projects, traditionally the organizations have cash flowed the actual construction project and then we've treated it as a reimbursement. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns the finance officer has had is not every time there's a construction draw, you don't give us the invoice, then we pay it monthly because that's going to be a lag. Does Black Hills Works have the would you have the funding in place to cash flow the actual construction if you were awarded and do a couple reimbursements? Yes, I, I am. I don't have my board of directors here, but I am confident that they would support that. I, I absolutely am confident. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Chair recognizes Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, for that presentation and for everything that you and your team are doing for the community. Um, you mentioned a few of the partners that you have that use the facility right now. I wondered if you could give us kind of a, a broad, more specific list of those. Well, and, oh, and then also, um, talking about memberships, I know that you, you noted in your initial application um, needing those membership fees, which are really low and wonderful. Um, if you've polled the community or how, how, you, how you've connected with community members, it sounds like you're definitely working in tandem with them, but what that looks like and, and just the need for that area specifically? Yeah, um, groups off the top of my head, you know, there is the baseball teams from Stevens High School use it every year for a big chunk of time. Central baseball teams do. Um, the Flame Special Olympics teams, basketball, track and field, um, uh, 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 bocce ball, uh, all kinds of Special Olympics events. Uh, there are volleyball teams that use it. There's um, um, some traveling volleyball teams in particular that don't necessarily have a home base. That I, I guess for all practical purposes use it as a home base. Uh, church groups that use it. Um, we have, oh, Cameron threw me a list here. Um, South Dakota School and Mines Badminton Group. Um, the, um, well, there's a ping pong group uh, that comes and use it. The Rushmore Rollers use it. Um, Bighorn Canyon Church uses it. Um, Bountiful Baskets use it. That isn't necessarily, uh, a, yeah, a, um, not a, a fitness thing, but definitely an awesome community uh, community thing. Um, it, all these obscure groups that are always looking for space that don't have homes and. Um, gym time, there's a heavy demand on gym time, we've really, really learned. And as far as working with our community, we, right now we, we've had a, sm a small component of a fitness center and we've partnered with various folks around our neighborhood to be able to get access to it via, uh, well initially we did keys and that turned into be a nightmare to manage, but then went to uh, a code access and letting people use it, actually we've never, we didn't, we haven't charged for that, but uh, the, the, the anecdotal stories that we hear is that there's nothing real close, though, and 
And if you look at an aerial map, there is quite a bit of residential around where we are located. So, Thank you very much. Yeah. Chair recognizes Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to echo the comments of my uh, fellow committee members and thanking you for your time the other night. The tour was fabulous. Um, at the tour, um, we visited a little bit about priorities and if we could only fund part of a project, um, what would it be? And I'm, it's a little different than the way you're showing your phases, your phase one and phase two. So could you share for the entire committee maybe what your priorities would be if we could only recommend funding part of the project? Yeah, if, if you look for, and I appreciate you guys asking that question during the tour because it really made me think, okay, what, how would the best priority, of, if you take a look at from our needs, where are our biggest needs? And that comment that I made, we put in this nice new floor with partnerships from the, the legends, riding it is working phenomenal and then our roof starts leaking. Uh, and that's a, a priority. So uh, being able to uh, finish the renovations on that gym as, as heavy as it gets used and um, wanting to use it even more would be, would be a priority. But then uh, the next priority would definitely be that fitness center um, where we are it's really really valuable to us and we have we, we have we're motivated to want to provide the most in health and fitness activities for the folks that we support um, you know, I made that comment that health and fitness is important for everyone for folks with disabilities that have a, a more challenges going on with their body than probably the typical uh, citizen does being able to have ways to move exercise be active is of paramount importance. And I just have this wonderful, wonderful dream of that being a community fitness center where it is folks that we support with developmental disabilities on a treadmill side by side with Joe community member and everybody's sweating to the oldies together. And um, well, thank you, sir. And uh, if, if I could barge in here, if you don't mind, um, you have, um, we have 404,000 $88.89 would do the, the, the fitness room equipment and all? Is that an accurate estimate? Um, well, the fitness room renovation at 202000 and the fitness room equipment at $86,000. Um, you know, that's... Are you going to need architect fees for that project? Yeah, there, a, portion of the, a portion of the architect fees would be for that port. That Shipping part. you're going to need? Yeah. Pardon? You're going to need the entry for shipping, the security system. Oh, yes, that is. Can you make, do, make live without the parking lot resurfacing? Yes. And then with respect to the other kind of 50% project here is the metal roof retrofit. Is that what we were talking about to take care of the leaking? Correct. So that's 64274 Will that... If, if you're awarded that, can will, will that work yes. to fix the roof? Yes. Those are my questions, and if uh, nobody else has any questions. And just so you know, you, you can drive by that facility, and you don't, you don't get any idea what just amazing work and how you're really helping these people. It's, it's uh, to go there and to see everything, and then you have that expansion for plays and and, and uh, it's really it's really amazing so we'd like to thank you very much for helping our community in that way thank you it's a labor of love we love <laughs> love 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 what we'd get to do thank you very much thanks and now we invite the canyon lake activity center please i think maybe Going, going. Good afternoon, Canyon Lake Activity Center. Please proceed with your presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Garfield, 
and I am the director of the Canyon Lake Activity Center. Uh, on behalf of our organization, I would like to uh, thank the Vision Fund Committee for the opportunity to share our presentation and request for Vision Funds today. Our organization is requesting funding approval in the amount of $40,000 to help fund the completion of six brand new outdoor pickleball courts, which we are scheduling for the completion in early summer of 2019. The plan for these new courts was for, formed a little over a year ago, born out of necessity to expand our ability to accommodate the incredible popularity of this crazy little game called pickleball. This game played with an oversized ping pong paddle and a little green wiffle ball. Currently we have about 100 players playing on three indoor pickleball courts and there are always players waiting on the sideline patiently for their turn to get onto the court. The plan laid out advantages and benefits that these new courts would bring to not only our center but to our city as well. But all of that had one big drawback, the cost. We, could, we quickly knew we would have to go outside of our organization to, um, for help that we would need for this project. The realization led us to quickly schedule a meeting with our Parks and Recreation Department for their expertise and possible sources of funding. The leadership was well aware of the popularity of the sport and was in complete agreement that our project was very much needed. But there was no funding available in their budget for pickleball courts. They were able to help us revise our plans though. With their input, we revised our plans to go from four courts to a total of six courts. Their recommendation was to go big or go home. And if in the end we wanted six courts, do it from the start and not piecemeal the project. Early on, we received a very important validation um, of importance and feasibility of our project, which came from one of our very own board members, one who happens to know a little bit about construction projects. His name is Jim Skull. Jim has been a, a very strong advocate for our project, and needless to say, his expertise and knowledge has been a driving force in the direction and progress of our project. We have a pickleball committee that has put in many hours working to move this project along with planning and fundraising. We have been able to garner support and donations from so many businesses and financial institutions that have joined with us to make these courts a reality. So as it stands right now, we are coming before you, raising just over 50% of our stated goal of $160,000. I think you can see that we have done our planning and homework and we have already broken ground. And we recently, cement was poured and so the pad is now in place and we are ready for the next phase. Now I would like to focus on the benefits that these new pickleball courts will soon make a reality. The Canyon Lake Activity Center is a nonprofit 501c3 organization and as such uh, we rely heavily on membership fees and activity cards and activity fees to uh, support our daily operations. Estimated projections based on 100 new players to our center would generate $6,000 in membership fees and approximately $24,000 in annual um, activity cards and fees over an annual period. There would also be the ability to host pickleball tournaments for our region of the country. Application fees, concessions, and pickleball uh, promotional items would be also a, uh, a way to generate thousands of dollars to support our center. If we were to host 100 players for a tournament, we could expect about $50 for entry fees totaling $5,000. If we are selling some small concessions or maybe a promotional pickleball t-shirt, um, we're looking at another $50 for a grand total for 100 players to total about $10,000. Multiply that fact 
that we are looking at hosting three tournaments a year. These types of numbers would have an incredible effect on what we are able to accomplish at our center. There are also plans being explored, such as city league play, uh, similar to bowling or pool, uh, pool leagues that are very popular in the city. <coughs> the benefits from the new courts would not only benefit our center, but Rapid City businesses as well. The numbers I will refer to now are directly from our Visitors Bureau. If we estimate a tournament, numbers of 100 players and 85 are from outside of the area coming to Rapid City to play their favorite game in the beautiful Black Hills, which is already a natural draw. Estimated revenue spent over the two-day period would be $80,000. The realization that every time a dollar is spent, it generates a sales tax and then gets turned over again several times to other businesses, generating more sales tax for the city. All of a sudden, a little weekend pickleball tournament seems very worthwhile. The benefits to the city will not only be realized in the form of sales taxes, they will also be realized every time someone is looking to retire or relocate to our part of the country. Important items looked at are recreation, health and fitness, and quality of life aspects that a city has to offer. Trust me when I say that when someone is looking at two different cities and one has a thriving older adult activity center with pickleball courts and one does not, the one with the center and the pickleball courts has a definite advantage. I make this statement by looking at what is going on at our center and all across the country uh, with this incredible popular game. I will try to relate what our city has the potential to experience with another city of about the same size. Bend, Oregon has a population of about 87,000 people and has a fairly similar climate to Rapid City. In the beginning, there were 16 active pickleball players and one public pickleball court, and they had one court they shared with basketball. In four years, the players numbered to over 1,000 players and they're playing on 46 permanent and temporary courts in the area. This is the type of potential growth that is going on all over the country. With our plans for six outdoor pickleball courts, I have recently proposed a plan to our board of directors to rework our wooden floors in our gymnasium, to remove volleyball and basketball striping, and to stripe the floor with three regulation pickleball courts. This move comes to coincide with scheduling of uh, the, the opening of our new courts in uh, this summer. This would give us a total of nine regulation pickleball courts. This will most definitely put our center on the cutting edge of the growing popularity of this sport. This is how much stock we have put into the belief that this sport will transfer our, transform our operations because of the financial and economic impact. So now I come before you with the knowledge that having accomplished some major work on seeing this project come to life and that we are not asking for the total cost of this project, the amount requested will help us to ensure the successful project completion by the beginning of this summer. I hope that I have been able to convey the importance of this project to the future relevance and viability of the Canyon Lake Activity Center. I hope that I've been given you a glimpse of potential economic and community benefits that our center and city would realize from these brand new pickleball courts. I hope that I have made our case for the Vision Fund Committee to make a decision to approve the Canyon Lake Activity Center's request for Vision Funds. Thank you very much. I can tell you that making a pitch for uh, pickleball courts is difficult and you've done an excellent job. <laughs> Thank you. Chair recognizes Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I really enjoyed the visit that we had uh, to see the location and, and the potential for those six new courts. It looks pretty fabulous. Um, I'd like you to kind of flesh out the numbers for me just a little bit. 
When I looked at your original application, your budget was about not quite $129,000. Um, you were proposing additional funding, I think $75,000 from members and another $10,000. I don't remember where that was going to come from. So to me, that was about $29,000 that you were going to need. But then when I looked at figure four, which you submitted later, it says project cost based on current bids and quotes of $200,000. So I'd just like you to clarify, if you would, um, the total cost of the project, how much funding you have currently available, exactly how much money you're going to need, and okay. how that's all going to play out for us, please. Sure. Thank you. Uh, right now, our plan has really gone through some revisions. Originally, we had, uh, it was well over $200,000 that we were going to be needing for this project. Um, we started the project and uh, the fundraising. Uh, we were looking at, uh, as we get through the project halfway or so, we decided that we were going to cut back on some things, uh, most notably lighting. Uh, that was something that we did take out of the project. Originally, that was in there. Um, being the fact that pickleball courts are going to be played uh, during the summer outdoor, and that usually we've got sunlight to uh, probably 8 or 9 o'clock, that we could probably scale back and take the lighting out of the project. So that was a big chunk of that funding that was <coughs> going to be removed. So um, right now we've got, as I mentioned, we have Jim Skull that's part of the, the project. He's been a strong advocate. And he's helping us to cut some costs. So there has been some really cost cutting that he's helped us with. So that's really kind of the big changes that we've seen uh, with uh, taking the lighting out of the project and the cost cutting measures. Uh, right now, we've got just a little over $82,000, um, and we do have uh, some potential for some extra fundraising um, uh, commitments for 2019. Uh, so right now, we, are, uh, we do have a shortfall, uh, but we are optimistic that we can still reach the goal of opening um, a grand opening summer of 2019. Uh, the $40,000 right now would not totally fund that completion, but we, with the commitments that we are getting, uh, we should be just right there at about the uh, exact amount. Chair recognizes Mark. Well, thank you, Michael. That was a great presentation, and I think, um, I think that George and I are probably closer to a pickleball challenge. You're more than welcome to come out, especially Monday nights. New players are more than welcome. Thank you. So my question for you is, in your application number 12, it says that you have 25000 in kind donation from Skull Construction and then 75000 in cash. But you also have noted that Denny Sanford Foundation is pending, uh, Gwendolyn Stearns Foundation is pending, and the MD MDU Resources Foundation. Uh, those are all pending. Uh, where are those? What is the status on those at this point in We've time? We've recently uh, received denials from those. Okay. So if if you did not receive Vision Fund, would this project still go forward? We're kind of in no man's land right now because it has started. Uh, if you were to go out and tour the site right now, you would see that the, the segment is poured. It looks great. Uh, you can just imagine the site now as it stands. Uh, and you can just visualize the courts. Uh, so yes, it would go forward. Uh, the vision funds would be greatly appreciated, be greatly needed. Um, but by all means, the project will press on. Um, Jim Skull, twenty-five thousand dollars in-kind donation uh, was a big was a big boost. Uh, we've had others that have stepped up. Uh, Larry Lewis, um, Pete Lean, those types of ind uh, influential individuals have kind of come in and with some cost-cutting measures and things that they're doing, Muth Electric. So some really good friends and partners of ours have kind of stepped in to help us with this project. Um, so we're right there at the end, and, um, and the vision funds would just would seal it for us in actuality. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? So, so just to confirm, there's six outdoor courts? Yes. And you're asking for how much from the Vision Fund? $40,000. If we gave you $35,000, can you run with that? We will run. <laughs> we will most definitely run. And we were out there, and uh, Mr. Skull has just, he said, let's get it done. And he's already 
laid it out, and it's, uh, you've come a long ways already, so it's uh, pretty admirable. It's very exciting. If you were to go out there and, and drive past the spot right now, like I said, the, the pad is, is poured, it's dried, and you can just visualize the colors and the fencing. And uh, I know our players are chomping at the bit to get out there this summer and get on the courts. So uh, we're very excited. Okay, well thank you very much and we appreciate that you brought so many of your young members from uh, the center with you. <laughs> thank you very much. Very well, we'll move on now to um, Children's Museum, please. Thank you. Okay, welcome, uh, Children's Museum, and uh, please proceed. Lindsay, do you have a presentation to pull up? Oh, there it is. Thank you. So good afternoon. I'm Lily Bruckner. I'm the founder and president of the Children's Museum of the Black Hills, and I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak with you today. And I'm Donovan Broberg, architect with ARC International. But my first introduction to Children's Museum of the Black Hills was as a founding 50 partner. Uh, shortly after the group organized, uh, they solicited community uh, involvement and we were quick to respond. Uh, we did this for our staff and their young families and uh, we've been excited to see how the Rapid City community has responded. Uh, we were lucky to become a, a Founding 50 partner because many people that uh, waited a little bit didn't get to be in that first group. And uh, it's, but they're a great organization uh, that we've been glad to come along and we're excited to serve them creatively uh, on the Children's Museum of the Black Hills. But also, uh, I'm one of their biggest fans. And as a new grandparent, I look forward to, to bringing my next generation to the community, uh, the Children's Museum of the Black Hills. So what is a children's museum? Children's museums are cultural institutions committed to serving the needs and interests of children by providing hands-on educational experiences and programs that stimulate curiosity and motivate learning. They are places where children learn through play and exploration and environments designed just for them. Everything is purposely scaled to the child and geared to engage, the pun intended geared and engaged to, to the child's mind in creating a world that needs to be explored and discovered. And children's museums are unlike anything currently offered in the Black Hills region. Our mission of the Children's Museum of the Black Hills is to inspire children and families to dream big dreams. Through creative play, exploration, and discovery, the museum sparks a culture of learning in families and the community. There are many benefits of having a children's museum. Children's museums help children develop essential foundational skills. They're environments where family are connected and do so in meaningful ways. They also respect childhood and letting kids be kids and the value of play. They light a spark for discovery and lifelong learning. Children's museums have the ability to change a generation. They also have the ability to change communities, serving as a catalyst for Rapid City's identity as a great place to live, learn, and play. Children's museums also strengthen community resources that educate and care for children. They're also uniquely positioned to reverse stigma and discrimination. They also contribute to local economies 
and to reduce economic barriers. One of the ways we'll be reducing economic barriers is by providing 30% free and reduced, reduced admission into the museum. We, and the Association of Children's Museums also reported that in 2016, Children's Museums contributed $5.5 billion to the local economy, or excuse me, to the U.S. economy. We developed a learning framework this fall with the help of local educators, both in early childhood and through the Rapid City School District. Those eight learning framework points are all based around play, and you've been provided with those. Recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics published an article that proves that play helps with um, developmental, in, including social, emotional, cognitive development, language, and self-regulation skills. Play is also fundamentally important for learning 21st century skills, such as problem solving, collaboration, creativity, which require the executive functioning skills that pr prove valuable adults. Our learning frameworks will also be matched to state, state curriculum standards and so when a teacher in the community wants to bring their class they will have a curriculum ready piece and tour of the museum. We also will be providing for students with special needs and sensory, sensory sensitivities and so we'll be providing a special place for those individuals as well. The Children's Museum of the Black Hills uh, has been operating for two and a half years without bricks and mortar. But as we've talked with them right from the start, they've, their heart has always been at the center of downtown Rapid City. There's, there's been a desire to be adjacent to, to the many family-friendly features that, uh, that are emerging in our downtown. Things like Main Street Square, uh, easy parking and access from the parking ramp, uh, movie theaters, performing arts centers, uh, eateries and retail. We've dreamed about the grand scheme, somehow weaving into the ever improving fabric of downtown Rapid City. Earlier this year, the initial location became a reality to found a facility in a historic storefront at 615 Main Street. This new colorful colorful facade introduces another world to be discovered beyond its threshold. The 2,500 square foot footprint plus an additional 800 square foot uh, partial mezzanine overlooks a tall two-story space. The existing building will be brought down to its bare bones before we start building new features into every cubic inch of opportunity. Beyond the essentials of, of family-friendly restrooms and a stroller-friendly elevator, uh, we'll have secure features and, uh, and all of that to, to lay the groundwork to where the fun begins. Um, just want you to use your imagination a bit. Everything is purposeful and has a function. The emphasis is on fun. Imagine bicycle-driven clocks, percussion furniture, a shop for magnetic structures, young artists' work emerging on glass walls. The list goes on. But probably my favorite, as you, as you look to the, the handout that I gave you, uh, shown, shown here is, is the tree house. Probably reminds me of my first architecture as a child myself. Uh, dreaming and designing and, and building uh, a treehouse structure. Um, we, we, we show this wonderful little climbing facility. Could you go a couple slides forward? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just an awesome way to, uh, to navigate through and explore the facility as a child, uh, discovering new things and uh, discovering them in a new way that challenges your mind to engage. Your investment of the community vision funds will be used to do the necessary remodel on the building with 100% being completely child-centered 
and inviting for children of all abilities and needs. It is truly an investment or a bridge to crossing cultural differences and opportunities. And based on our projections from similar sized communities and similar sized children's museums, we anticipate that we will be able to host 34,000 individuals on an annual basis. This does not incorporate any tourism traffic as sometimes that can be fluctuating and we want to make sure that we're a long, long time sustaining asset to the community for generations to come. So the Children's Museum and its partners believe that over the next generation, it is possible to enrich lives and expand the cir circle of opportunity for children in the Black Hills region. We want to provide year-round educational opportunities that focus on the uniqueness of the Black Hills region. We closely align with the comprehensive and cultural plan that the city has set out for itself, and we look forward to incorporating many of those aspects in the museum. I mentioned earlier the amazing response to the original founding 50 sponsorship. The Children's Museum of the Black Hills continues to see great support and response from the community. When this project was announced earlier this year, we had, we had several engineers and contractors, even suppliers of materials, uh, call and ask, uh, how can we contribute and be a part of the project? So it is already well on its way to pro progressing towards its goal. We don't want to replicate any services currently offered in Rapid City. We want to be a unique facility for primarily focused on children, and we want to foster relationships with other community partners. These are some of the organizations that we could or have par already partnered with, and um, we look forward to continuing those conversations. This is just a brief glimpse of what we have done without with a museum without walls. We've served approximately 22,000 kiddos and their families over the past two and a half years. So imagine the impact we can have without those. So these next few slides are just some pictures from some of these events. And I know I'm going quickly. I want to keep you on your, your time schedule. And this was our first annual Touch a Truck event we did this fall. We um, had eight, over 850 partici or, um, visitors to this event. It was a fundraiser held at Black Hills Harley Davidson. And we had um, 37 trucks from different organizations. So, And this was our most recent. But I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Chair recognizes Megan. Thanks for the great presentation and handout. Um, very colorful, and Stacy, see the little, little kiddos out here as well. <clears throat> um, according to your financials, with the expenses, you're renting the space that you're going to have the museum in, correct? Correct. Um, what is your term of agreement with that facility in terms of um, moving forward, um, remodeling it, and such? and how long is that lease with that facility? Sure, we have a three-year lease with two additional three-year terms that we can extend. So potentially we could be in this space for up to t um, nine years. And the owners, um, Larry and Sue Heil, are very much um, committed to this project and they want to be part of this. And so I anticipate that we can have a long-standing relationship in this building um, until we outgrow it which I anticipate will be sooner rather than later, but. Any other questions? Chair recognizes city attorney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Donovan, I think you were in uh, the audience when I asked the question of Black Hills Works, and I would have a similar question. What's your plan, I guess, for funding the construction, uh, the actual construction, if you don't get the vision funds until a reimbursement situation. And, and Lily didn't have a chance to hear that, but uh, my diagnosis of that question related to um, the Children's Museum of the Black Hills is, is very similar, that uh, the, uh, the, the financial uh, structure of the Children's Museum and the project would be such that it could uh, roll through 
several months and, and get reimbursements um, as, as, as they become available. Okay. And at this point, I'm more asking because I don't want people to have unrealistic expectations and think that if they were awarded vision funds that they're immediately going to get a check which they can then use to, to fund the actual construction that, that we want to make sure the construction we're paying for work that's completed versus uh, turning over all the money and that's the way we've been trying to handle it with all the vision projects. So. I think that's appropriate, and we've been uh, involved in previous vision fund projects and seen the uh, the same flow. So, chair recognizes Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation. It looks like a ton of fun for kids. Although your tree made me a little nervous as a parent. <laughs> They're all enclosed okay. <laughs> with the safety and security <laughs> at our top priority. So, so. In your application, you talked about your goal is to raise $850,000, and at that point, you were at 2% of the goal and confident that you would be able to raise $850,000. Can you give um, the committee an update on your fundraising status, um, possibility of any other grant applications you might have out there, any other fundraising you're doing, and, and kind of where you're at right now? Absolutely. So in the follow-up questions you had sent, um, you had indicated this would be one of them. Our capital campaign actually didn't start until this, pre this past August. So August 2018 was the official kickoff of our capital campaign. So we are five months in and we've raised um, just over $50,000. We also have a few um, larger asks out there. We're also going to be applying for a variety of grants and um, we're in the process of cultivating some relationships um, with both individual donors as well as businesses. I know Shields, for example, has indicated um, that they're interested in being involved in this process. And in that type of situation, they would most likely be sponsoring some sort of exhibit, for example, the climbing tree. And so um, the climbing tree, um, how we figure exhibit space cost is you can figure about 250,000, or excuse me, $250 a square foot. And so, um, that just kind of is how we multiply it out, and that's actually below the industry average for exhibits. Any other questions? I have a few, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, so, are you your your organization is up and running? You just don't have a place to hang out, so to speak. Correct. Yep. And so the activities that you uh, showed us photos of that you do out outdoor events. How, how many of those do you? do maybe in the year? It depends on the year. Um, we have participated in the majority of the ones that, that Main Street Square host. Anything that's super family friendly, we try to be involved with, um, with the understanding that time, energy, and finance contributes to our ability to do that. Um, and those events sometimes can become costly, and so we have to weigh the value of putting $500 into a community event or putting that $500 into an exhibit in our future space. And so you have the space, is this a done deal that you have at least? Correct. Yep. And have, are your doors open to the public? We are not right now because um, one of the challenges we face is that many individuals in the community are going to be comparing us to Brookings and to Denver because those are the two closest children's museums. So if we were to open as it was today, people would come in and be underwhelmed and that's going to kind of sink us in the water before we even have a chance. So we're very thoughtful in determining what needs to go into the museum and being making sure that we're prepared to open. Um, and really wow the public before we jump into it. And the climbing tree, that would be inside? Correct, yep. And, and how so much is that going to cost? It or is that going to be donated? It depends on um, if we create it ourselves or um, like some of the images of the climbers, climbing structures, climber, climbing structures, excuse me, that we showed, um, those can range up into the millions if you want them to. So um, it just really depends on what it's going to look like in the end. We don't have exact numbers on those. You don't have a, a number on what something that you could put in there, like, or um, when? Well, I can tell you, um, Phoenix Children's Museum, for example, has a uh, climbing structure that costs $2 million. 
So they range, I mean, they can range from $100,000 to upwards of $2 million. So it's really going to depend on what we decide to finally put in there. And we and believe that we could build a lot of it ourselves. And you, um, so you're asking for how much from the Vision Fund again? For $400,000. And the and the the figure of eight hundred thousand. What's that? Yep. So the eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars for our total project cost is the estimated cost to do the construction and also provide the exhibits for the interior space. And so from the city, we're asking for a significant investment in the future of the kids. And if the F vision fund were to say approve maybe a, a contribution of two hundred and fifty thousand, would that that help things out? Would that can you Absolutely. get up, up and running with that? We may not be able to get up and running, but we're going to be darn close. We can. Um, we would have to really tailor what we're planning in order to make that work. But um, any money, I believe, is going to be a help and a step in the right direction to get other funders on board as well. OK. And then there's a young lady here with glasses in the front row here with dark hair. Mm -mm. You? <laughs> you? Right here in the front row, you? Yes? Can, can you tell us what your name is? Do you think this is a good idea? Yes? No? Anybody, any of the young members have an idea? Raise your hand. Kiddos, who thinks this is a great idea? Raise your hand. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that climbing tree. I think I might come down. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our uh, last presentation from the early afternoon, uh, we welcome Community Health Center. You guys hear me? Good Please afternoon. begin. What's up? You ready? Yes. Okay. Go for it. Am I on the clock? Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for taking the time. To, uh, my name is Tim Trithart. I'm the CEO for the Community Health Center of the Black Hills. Uh, let me start by saying, um, let's just get out of the way. This presentation will not be nearly as sexy as the other ones that you've seen. I, uh, I don't have any fancy tree houses for this project. Um, I don't have lots of kids in the audience. I brought my son. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, I don't have a pickleball committee. I wish I did. Um, but I, I'm here to basically, obviously, request some vision funds for uh, a really unsexy project, uh, a medical records storage facility. Maybe you guys find that much sexier than I do. But um, I, I can tell you that uh, though it's not very sexy, it's obviously very integral into what we do at the Community Health Center. Um, what do we do at the Community Health Center? For those of you that don't know, uh, we're basically a uh, doctor, dental, mental health facility uh, providing basic primary care. Uh, the, anybody can come to our doors, uh, through our doors, and be a patient of ours, uh, though we have a special niche uh, for serving those that are underserved. Uh, uh, most of the patients that come through our doors are low income uh, and come through our doors to uh, uh, qualify uh, for care on a sliding scale. And so we subsidize basically the care that they come through there. Uh, we're not a free clinic. A lot of people think sometimes that we are a free clinic. We're not. Uh, there is a small subset of our population that does get free care, uh, primarily uh, health care for the homeless uh, folks that come through, those that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, but for everybody else, we basically charge them basically a flat fee uh, based on their level of income. So, uh, and then we subsidize the rest of that. So uh, more than half of our board have to be users of our facility. They have to be patients uh, and walk through our doors just like anybody else and use our, use our services. Uh, a lot of folks assume that we have some big, huge stream of government funding, that, you know, that we're a city agency or that we're a county agency or a federal agency. We're not. We're uh, a 501c3 uh, standalone that we've got a board of directors. Uh, we just apply for a lot of grants. And so one of the big grants that we get is we get a federal grant uh, that uh, qualifies that we have to do all the stuff to be a community health center. Uh, and, but roughly our budget, as you guys can see, is about nine million bucks, and uh, we get grant funding for about three million bucks, and that basically allows us to provide care on a sliding scale. So we fill a need for roughly about 13,000 patients that walk through our doors. 
Uh, some of these numbers I noticed uh, when I was looking through this uh, just in there are a little bit flipped. Uh, about a third of our patients actually, not 44 percent, are uninsured. Uh, and so those are folks that uh, come through our doors. And for us, we're keeping them out of the emergency room. Uh, we're hopefully keeping them healthy and keeping them, uh, if they're homeless, uh, we're keeping them hopefully uh, out of the emergency room, out of hospitalization, keeping them healthy. Uh, roughly about last year, about 1,000 patients of ours were homeless. And a good chunk of those, you can see 167 of those were children that were classified as homeless that came through our doors. And so that's really at the core of what we do. Uh, roughly about 44 percent of our patients are on Medicaid. And so uh, a lot of those obviously are kids. So while I don't have a whole audience of kids that can raise their hands for you, I can guarantee you that we see a lot of kids that uh, rely on us for our services. 16% uh, of our patients last year were insured. So they had some sort of insurance. And so that could be, uh, like me, uh, uh, I go through there and that I have insurance, but I can tell you that I can afford, obviously, to go anyplace else. Uh, a lot of our patients that come through our doors that uh, have insurance, they have really high deductibles. And so they can still qualify on our sliding scale, and so they can get reduced rates to be able to, to get access to our care, to get access to uh, cheaper meds, uh, to get their teeth cleaned, all that sort of stuff. And then roughly about 6% of our patients are on Medicare. So what am I asking for? Uh, we've got all those patients, uh, and each one of those patients, what they have all in common is they all have a medical record that we have to keep. Uh, and unfortunately, we have to keep medical records for a long, long time. Uh, we're legally required to keep medical records uh, of every patient that walks through our doors for a minimum of 10 years after their last encounter with us. Uh, and then for minors, we have to keep it a minimum of two years after the patient turns 21 or seven years after their last encounter date, whichever is longer. So what that means is that if we have a patient that comes through our door, if you have a newborn baby that you come through and boy, you're really going to get on board with uh, bringing them to community health and you bring them in, they're one month old, and then next week you decide you're moving to Arizona, we have to keep that medical record there until that kid turns 21 years old. So we have to be able to keep that and be able to pull it when you finally ask for it when they're, you know, 18 years old and say, hey, we brought them in there back in 2000 and whatever. We need a copy of that. Uh, we have to keep them secure. We have to keep them obviously confidential. Uh, and so they have to be in a nice secure spot. And so they obviously have to be accessible because uh, people will ask for these old records. Um, and uh, typically we get about three to five requests that we have to go uh, and pull these records out of storage. Right now, we've got approximately 110,000 individual charts that we keep in six rented storage facilities. Uh, uh, naturally, these storage facilities aren't next to each other. We've got them in different parts of town, uh, wherever we could get them. Uh, and uh, a lot of times people ask in terms of, well, why don't you just scan them all into your electronic medical record, you know, and do all that. Well, the fact of the matter is it's just it's really time consuming to do that. You're talking probably about 15 minutes probably per chart to be able to do that. So once you factor in 110,000 going through all that, considering you're probably only going to retrieve three to five of them that you're really going to have to access, we're really just holding on to them until we can start to purge them. Uh, the difficult thing is that obviously having these things at six different storage facilities all across town requires a staff member to go to each of these storage facilities to retrieve, to purge, to organize. It's not the most ideal situation. So, and we have to pay for them. So we have to pay roughly about $13,500 every year just for these storage facilities. So what we've been looking for is a way basically that we can consolidate all of these into one sort of storage facility that we can keep all of our medical records in a nice, safe, secure sort of spot basically located on our property. So uh, some of you may remember that a couple of years ago I came before you guys and you guys were uh, gracious enough to uh, provide us with some vision funds to allow us to begin uh, expanding more into the mental health area. Uh, and so we actually are beginning construction this week on our, our mental health pod that we should have open. Uh, come March. Uh, as part of that, uh, kind of concurrently with that, we also completed the designs of what it would take for a medical record facility to build it basically on our property, kind of on the north side of the property. And when we bid out our mental health pod, we also asked for an alternate bid in terms of what the bid would cost to basically build this, that should we be successful in getting funds to be able to do that. Um, I'm happy to report that the bids did come in. Uh, I'm asking 165,000, our bids came in about 159,900. So pretty close to what we had estimated to where we'd be. Um, and then hopefully that if we were able to get the funds that we'd be able to begin construction on this really as soon as we're done with that uh, mental health pod or probably concurrently depending on the weather. The, um, so 
How does this align with the Rapid City Comprehensive Plan? I've read that thing cover to cover. You guys touch nothing in there about medical records, surprisingly. Um, but it does really because it obviously supports in terms of what we do at the Community Health Center. Uh, uh, you know, the comprehensive plan is that uh, obviously puts a big focus on health care and not only enhancing the quality but increasing the accessibility. Obviously that $13,500 that we're putting towards that, we would basically be redirecting that towards our operations. Uh, and really, what, candidly, what we'd be using it for is to help us subsidize as we grow into that mental health. We've been kind of trying to figure out how we can increase the staff. It's one thing, obviously, to build the building, which you guys were there, but how do I support the staff? We're right now got some grant funding so that I can recruit for a psychiatric nurse practitioner, which we are actively doing so that we have that person on board. We'll obviously need some support staff. This sort of funding would allow us basically to redirect that funding that right now is just going to pay for storage space. So that's how it aligns with the Rapid City Comprehensive Plan. That's it. Short, sweet, to the point. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Chair recognizes Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the presentation, and I think I speak for the entire committee when I say we're really excited to see that mental health pod up and running. Um, looking forward to, to that um, coming to fruition. I have um, some questions specifically related to your comment about um, creating electronic files with these records. I'm assuming that at this point, all new medical records are electronic. Yes. And that as we are um, phase as as children reach 21 or whatnot that you're purging and so the space that you're requesting now is probably the max space Correct. that you're going to need Correct. and that as you're purging those yep. eventually at some point Correct. you won't need that space anymore Correct yeah yeah so we what, purge right now at about 1500 a year is what okay. we're purging so right now we're kind of planning this is the maximum amount that we'd use there always obviously will be some paper stuff that you end up having to, to, to store and all that but we would assume that it would reduce over time, and at some point we'd be able to see if we can't figure out how to, you know, we've had some internal discussions in terms of what we would do with that, you know, in terms of, you know, food, uh, you know, uh, working with the, you know, food to put in a food thing, storage facility for uh, okay. um, uh, exercise sort of area. There's a whole bunch of different ideas that we could repurpose. So, it so, you, so you don't have a specific plan for the space no, once the not. records no. are all gone. And do you have any idea how long it's going to take before all those records are purged? Well, a while. Uh, since we have to hold them on for 21 years, there's quite a bit of those that are pediatric. You can see the big percentage of patients that we see that are pediatric. Right now we're seeing about, like I said, about 1,500 a year. that will probably ramp up as we get a little further along the way. So we probably have it probably for a good 10 years, I would think. Okay. Thank you. Give or take. Chair recognizes Megan. Thanks for your presentation. Um, as a clinician, I can um, really um, validate the importance of keeping medical records safe. Um, as of right now, what are you doing with these six separate places that you're keeping these medical files in terms of safety and um, what measures, if you move to this new location, um, will help the, ensure the safety of the records even further? Well, obviously having them all in one spot allows us then to make sure that everything's all standardized in terms of how we're storing them. Uh, having them in a secure facility, right now they're basically just in your standard storage sort of units is where they're at. So nothing too much more glamorous than that. This obviously would allow us to keep them on one site. We'd be able to have the security cameras that would be, you know, there. Uh, we'd be able to badge access so that we could see exactly who's getting in, who's getting out. Thank you. Sir, I have a couple questions. We, um, this is the same committee that <laughs> worked with you a couple years ago. We came out and saw your facility. So um, the, the funding that you got the last time around, that went to the mental health pod? Correct. And then that is, has been under construction or, or? We had to put the construction on hold last year, if you remember, there was some, uh, uh, because of that big grant that we get from the federal government, there were the, when the last time the, the government shut down, uh, the ongoing funding for community health centers was put on hold, basically. And so there was a little question in terms of how our ongoing funding would go on. So we put on hold in terms of we couldn't recruit, basically, to hire. And so we put on hold, and so we finished up the designs this summer, and so we went out for bid, and so now, once that got straightened out, so. And do you have any alternative sources of uh funding for this project? Candidly, we haven't looked 
quite yet. Uh, you know, that uh, I think that if we did not get any vision funds, we'd probably go back to our board of directors and decide exactly what exactly what our options would be in terms of, uh, you know, do we want to fund this ourselves? You know, do we want, you know, that's a lot of cash for us to pull out of the bank to be able to do that. Uh, how we uh, structured our uh, uh, initial building uh, doesn't allow us to go for any more uh, uh, loans and things like that with the new market tax credit, so we can't go for any more bank loans. So we'd have to look at some alternative sort of sources. And the, the, the the storage area, do you already have a shell for that or you have to build the entire thing? We would have to build the whole thing, yeah. So we'd have to pour, pour the foundation and do all that. We've got the spot sort of designated for it. But. And if Vision Fund were to grant maybe 50% of your request, is, do you think you can get things done in a year? Or? I think that, yeah. Yeah, that that would certainly help. That would allow us in terms of, yeah, make it a little easier for our board to swallow, pulling some of that cash out of the bank. Okay. Well, I don't, anybody else? And just to, to remind everybody, we were there a couple of years ago, and, it, and the services you provide are amazing. And I, I still remember all those dental chairs. I, that was pretty cool. <laughs> thank you very much. You guys are all welcome to come down as patients. So thank you guys very much. And for the record, uh, just in the middle of the pickleball presentation, my son said, they're not going to give you any money. I really think pickleball is where they should give all their money to. So just <laughs> throw it out there. We'll put it in the record. <laughs> okay, I think that's good to go for first half of the day. Correct? Lindsay? All right, crack the whip and...